Let me ask you this. Have you ever felt like you're impossibly trapped in a meaningless existence and you feel helpless to do anything about it? Today, that's what we're going to look at. And I really think you might want to hear this. That's today's Authentic. Depending on your situation, a lifetime here on planet Earth can feel a, a little bit like a prison sentence. After all, none of us actually asked to be here. This life is involuntary. You had no say when it came to where you'd be born or who your parents would be. And you've really got no choice but to struggle your way to the finish line, where either your body succumbs to the harsh reality of aging, or you're somehow tragically terminated before the insurance actuary tables say it's your time. So what happens to a lot of people, once they recognize and accept their own mortality, they just begin to mark off time, counting down the days to the finish line. Ah, sure, we make note of significant milestones like we're checking off some kind of list. We start school, we leave school, we launch a career, we get married, we have kids, we get old, we retire, we have grandkids, and then eventually we draw our last breath and close our eyes for the last time. And I know I'm sounding kind of defeatist and cynical, but stick with me. I mean, I've been in the preacher business long enough to know that what I just described is the daily reality for an awful lot of people. They just spend the bulk of their days counting the minutes till they die. Now, that's not to say that their lives aren't punctuated by some incredible moments of joy, and I'm not suggesting that these people might be depressed or discouraged. Some of them, in fact, seem to be fine with the way life is playing out, and they're happy to put in their time doing the very same things that other people do, which includes hanging it up in the end zone and slipping into your casket. Most of us are just resigned to the reality of life. But then you, you find these other people who actually get a little angry once they realize how little control most of us actually have. At a very young age, we're told that we can be anything we want to be. We can do anything we want to do. But then the process of actually living in this place can begin to make those affirmations seem like a lie. We discover unfortunate things like opportunity cost, because life is far too short to accomplish everything on your bucket list. I mean, most of us aren't going to become surgeons and lawyers and authors and political leaders and accomplished musicians and whatever it else it was that you wanted to be. I mean, there are those few rare exceptions to the rule, those very rare people who are actual polymaths. But for the most of us, there's not enough time in one lifespan to do everything. And for some people, that discovery can trigger a little resentment. I'm reminded of a passage from the Bible where it tells us that one short lifetime isn't actually enough to do everything you want to do. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 8 says, The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Th that's a statement made by somebody who's contemplating the vanity of life. He's bemoaning the fact that life seems far too short, and then when it's over far too quickly, you'll be powerless to hang on to your own accomplishments. Now, at first reading, the book of Ecclesiastes can feel like a work of dark pessimism. But even the most ironclad Pollyanna has to admit that the author kind of has a point. Anything that you and I attempt to accomplish in this life never seems to last. The shelf life of your accomplishments is painfully short. I mean, just think about the 8 billion people who live on this planet right now. And suddenly, the list of historical people we tend to remember seems pretty small. The vast majority of us live obscure, practically invisible lives. And even if you do happen to become famous, most folks are only remembered for a handful of trivial facts, and then only for a generation or two. I mean, just let's consider the case of Napoleon Bonaparte. How much do you really know about him? Most of you know he was French, he was ill-tempered and short, and you might even remember that he had his hand inside his coat when he posed for an official portrait. 
You likely know that he invaded Russia and got defeated by the brutal winter, and you probably know he was defeated ultimately at the Battle of Waterloo and then spent the rest of his life in exile. You might even know the name of his wife, Josephine. But then, if you're not a history major, what else do you know? Not much. Napoleon is one of the most infamous names in European history, and I managed to list off everything that most people know in a few seconds. You and I? Well, 200 years after I die, how much do you think people are going to remember about me? Pretty much nothing. I mean, I don't really know much about my great-grandfathers, and that's not even 200 years ago. Now, this is a thought that I've explored with you before, and I probably gave it the broadest treatment when we talked about the 6th century Christian philosopher Boethius, a very popular and successful man who suddenly found himself condemned to die for crimes he didn't commit. They called him a spy, and he discovered that all of his accomplishments suddenly meant nothing, not when the Grim Reaper is standing outside your prison cell. I mean, let's be honest, he's hardly alone. As a minister, I've had the opportunity to sit with an awful lot of dying people, and I can tell you that in the last five minutes of your life, all that stuff that seems so unbelievably important to you right now, you'd give it all up on the spot if it meant you could buy just a little more time, that is, if you're not suffering. And the fact that most of what you do is just going to vanish, that's a reality that makes the practice of marking time between your birth and death all the more fascinating. You really need to ask yourself, is the way that you're living now really going to matter when you realize you're out of time? Are the things you prize at this moment really going to seem valuable when you hit that home stretch? Or will most of your activities just look like tally marks on the wall of a prison cell, mindlessly marking the days before death comes to get you? I know that for me, some of life's milestones have been incredibly valuable because they help me define who I am as a person, like my marriage to Jean or the birth of my children. Those were such big game changers that I can hardly begin to describe how much value they added to my life. Just those two things, or really those three people, have infused my life with a sense of purpose. They give me something to live for. And I'm pretty sure you've got similar things in your life, those things that make it seem like life's pretty good. But then, outside of those few big highlights, a lot of people have this tendency to just lurch from one moment to the next, hoping that whatever comes next will be pretty good. When I was back in high school, the next thing would be graduating and going to college. And when I arrived at the university, it kind of felt like I was just checking a box on the life list. The same thing happened to you. Your first job, check. Your first mortgage and house, check. Turning 30, check. Turning 40, check. 50, check. 60, check. Eventually, if the Lord sees fit and your finances somehow allow it, you get to retire. Another check. Maybe take up a hobby, check. And then you clutch your chest, your heart stops, and you die. And that's the final check mark. Now, I don't know if you do this, but given the inevitability of death, I mean, let's be honest, none of us gets out of here alive. Sometimes I find myself trying to imagine what my final moments are actually going to be like. Will I be in the hospital, surrounded by friends and family, with my wife holding my hand as I slip into the dark? Or will I, God forbid, be somewhere by myself, in a hotel room or a work trip, or flying over the ocean in a plane that doesn't actually make it? As you get older and you start to feel the aches and pains, you begin to wonder, is, is this one going to heal, or am I going to be stuck with this pain for the rest of my life? When is a symptom going to escort me to a doctor who tells me I'm not going to make it? You know it's going to happen sometime, somehow. Now, to be honest, the thought of dying doesn't actually scare me because of what I've found in the pages of the Bible. But that doesn't mean I don't think about it, especially as the calendar keeps pushing me into the future. I mean, in some ways, it's just a matter of making hash marks on the prison wall, counting down the days. And if you find that kind of depressing, hang in there, because it's not as hopeless as it sounds. So you start counting the seconds right now until the break is over, and then we'll reconvene to think about this just a little bit more. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. 
Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Just before the break, I mentioned that the thought of dying doesn't actually scare me. Now, that doesn't mean I have a death wish and I would like to put in more time. So I don't want to die because I find this world just too wonderful and interesting to check out now. But the thought of mortality, knowing that I'm not the one person who isn't going to die, that doesn't scare me. And maybe that's because I already had a scare quite a few years ago and I was convinced that I'd arrived at the finish line. And so I guess in some ways, I've already dealt with some of the emotions that come from realizing that time is up. But my low sense of fear actually comes from a principle you find in the Bible, found in Hebrews chapter 2. And some of you who watch this show regularly will recognize this because I read this at least once a season. It's just that good of a thought. Listen to what this says. It's talking about the incarnation of Christ. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The author seems to agree that a human lifetime can feel a little like a prison. In fact, he goes a step further and calls it slavery. None of us ask to be born. And absolutely none of us on the day we were born made a voluntary appointment to die. But here we are with the specter of death hanging over every second of our lives, and that profoundly affects how we live. A lot of people panic, sensing that life is far too short, and they try to cram in so much that they become too busy to slow down and enjoy life. Other people become paralyzed by fear, so they do practically nothing and they waste the time they've got. Knowing that you're going to die absolutely changes how you live. I mean, what would you do differently if you knew that life wasn't limited? What if you didn't have to live your whole life as if you were wolfing down a quick sandwich over the sink so you could get back to work? What if life was more like slowly relishing an expensive four-star dinner? What would you do differently if you didn't have this sense that you were being carried along too quickly to the finish line? How many of those painful regrets that haunt you were the result of hasty decisions that came out of a sense of panic? What if life wasn't a prison sentence, but a big opportunity? Let me show you something that I find absolutely fascinating, and it's the way that Jesus introduced his public ministry to the whole world. This took place on Sabbath, and so, of course, the Bible tells us that Jesus was in the synagogue. It tells us that was his custom. And by some remarkable coincidence, when it was Jesus' turn to read Scripture, they gave him the Isaiah scroll, and here's what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor." Now, if I'm reading that right, it would seem like God Himself thinks that a human lifetime is a bit of a prison sentence, at least in a broken world. And one of the key promises of the long-awaited Messiah was to set us free from that penitentiary. There's no way that Jesus read that passage by accident. It wasn't a coincidence because he was the anointed one Isaiah was predicting when he wrote it 700 years earlier. So let's consider the magnitude of what Jesus said. He is, of course, the most influential person of all time. I mean, there's a good reason the whole world seems to be aware of him. The people who knew Jesus personally insist that he was the Son of God, God in human flesh. They tell us that he not only died an unimaginably cruel death on a Roman cross, but he actually came back. He rose from the dead. That's the person who's telling us that he knows how to release you from the prison yard of life. So try to imagine, no more tally marks on the walls marking the days of predictable drudgery till you're gone. Imagine not having to worry about the briefness of life or having to wrestle with the disappointment that comes from not being able to do everything you want to do. Imagine actually getting to the finish line, knowing it's not over, 
knowing that you haven't just wasted a few decades on a meaningless existence. Imagine knowing that someone, in fact, the source of all life, actually knows your name and thinks you're significant. And imagine being able to take your regrets, those painful moments when you know you blew it, when you know you left a messy divot on the golf course of life. Imagine being able to find peace of mind over that. I mean, it's not that God's going to just take away all the consequences of your bad choices because He doesn't always do that, trust me. I mean, the Bible's full of examples of people who had to live with what they did. King David, for example, his affair with Bathsheba wreaked absolute havoc on the rest of his family. But now, instead of being chained to what you were, instead of being trapped by what you really don't like about yourself, instead of being locked in a prison cell of regret, Try to imagine knowing that you are no longer what you once were. Imagine being able to look at the mess you've made of the past and you can smile because you know for sure that God's okay with you. Instead of living for nothing, instead of casting about looking for some kind of purpose, imagine knowing that your life's agenda is actually starting to harmonize with the priorities of God Himself. What if you could wake up every morning and know that you're not going to waste the day? What if every moment, every single breath you take is saturated with purpose or e even joy? Just listen to this amazing passage that Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, at first glance, that doesn't sound very attractive because who in the world wants to be crucified? Crucifixion was an incredibly cruel form of punishment and it was humiliating. It was the worst thing the Romans could do to you. But this is not talking about physical death. It's talking about taking your meaningless existence, the one that's racked with pain and regret, and exchanging it for something far more meaningful. The old you dies and there's a new, more authentic you. In our natural everyday state, you and I really are prisoners. We're just marking time till we disappear. We live with pain, with remorse, and we're helpless to change it. But then we see this rabbi from Nazareth open the Isaiah scroll and he tells us it doesn't have to be like this. Why? Because he's one of us now. And now you suddenly have a choice. You live for self, which does nothing but underline the fact that we're prisoners, or you can crucify that hopeless self-centered person and start to live differently. Nobody who has ever taken a serious look at the biography and teachings of Christ would ever suggest that he wasted his life. I mean, look at the way he changed the whole world. And Paul says that Christ is willing to live that same kind of profoundly meaningful life all over again through you. I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. You know, when you read John's Gospel, there's this almost painful sense of urgency in the background of the story. The entire narrative kind of feels like you're being carried along uncontrollably toward that moment when Christ gets murdered. The language is saturated with foreshadowing, giving you constant reminders that Jesus has this unavoidable appointment with death. I'll give you just one example from one of my favorite stories in John chapter 4, where Jesus meets that woman at the well. Here's what it says. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The sixth hour of the day, back in biblical times, was noon. And honestly, most people didn't draw their water that time of day because it was so hot out. And it was a lot more pleasant first thing in the morning. But in this story, we're talking about a woman who lived with an awful lot of shame. 
She'd been married five times, and now she's shacked up with some guy who's not her husband. Chances are, she's the talk of the town, the victim of gossip. And so the odds are pretty good that she's visiting the swell in the heat of the day to avoid making personal contact. It's just too painful. I think it's a relatively safe assumption because John goes out of his way to give us all those details about her life. But then I want you to notice what Jesus says when he meets her at the sixth hour, right at noon. He tells her he's thirsty. And those of you who have read the rest of John's Gospel know that Jesus says the same thing when he's hanging on a cross. He says, I thirst. And when did Pilate deliver him to be crucified? John 19 tells us it was the sixth hour, the same moment that Jesus made that statement at the well. Now, that's the kind of foreshadowing you find all the way through the Gospel of John. There's this dark sense that the cross is unavoidable, that it has to happen. And the sand in Jesus hourglass is running out very fast. And there's something kind of familiar about the pace of the story. It reminds me of that dark sense that you and I have that life is carrying us along far too quickly, taking us to our doom. And we can suddenly see that Jesus really does identify with how we feel, what it means to live here. He also lived under the shadow of death, feeling that same relentless march to the end, the one that compromises our ability to live the way we wish we could. When the Bible says that Jesus lived a real human life, when it says He became sin for us, it also means He experienced that same dark sense of doom that we tend to feel when we suddenly realize that we're not just in prison, but on death row, and we've run out of appeals. I mean, how else do you explain the cry from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was feeling what you feel. And in that moment, we can see that God has not only noticed our problem, He's also felt it. And He knows that this is not the way He created us. He did not design this planet as a prison cell. So watch the Son of God as He joins us right here in our miserable existence, as He experiences what it means to mark those painful moments that carry you forward to that disappointing end. On the evening of that day, the Bible tells us, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. You know, sometimes people tell me that that verse is the reason that Christians changed the Sabbath to Sunday because it mentions the first day of the week and it seems like it's a worship service. But I've discovered it's really hard to build that case because that's clearly not a worship service. The disciples are terrified that they might be the next ones to get nailed to a cross, so they're hiding. They're marking time, waiting for the worst which should come at any moment. And then Jesus, who experienced that same angst we tend to feel, only worse, suddenly appears and tells them, there's nothing to worry about. Peace be with you, he said. So what does that mean for you? It means you're no longer on a hopeless slide to the grave, marking the moments of a meaningless life until death comes knocking. God took human form and defeated death, and you no longer have to live in a prison yard captive to fear. I mean, you, you will have to suffer a little as you get to the end. We all do. But honestly, that thought no longer bothers me like it used to. From the Bible's perspective, from the perspective of a risen Christ, I can now have what Paul calls the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. I'll be right back after this. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers and guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com 
and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. Right before we took that break, I quoted from the book of Philippians, where Paul tells us that we can actually have peace of mind. But let me put that statement in its proper context for you now, because what Paul promises is really pretty astonishing. And as we read this together, I want you to compare what we're reading to that awful sense that most of us have that we're trapped in some kind of meaningless life. Here's what Paul writes, and we're going to begin in verse 4. He says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Many years ago, Hugh Latimer, the one-time chaplain to King Edward VI, was condemned to die under the brutal reign of Mary Tudor, sometimes called Bloody Mary. And as he was waiting to be executed, it got really, really, really cold one night in his jail cell. Imagine, it's made out of stone, it's damp, he's freezing. So he asked the jailer, hey, can I have a fire to warm myself at? And the jailer got irritated. No fire for the heretics. Well, but you don't understand, Latimer told the jailer. If you don't let me build a fire, I'm going to die of exposure. And if I die of exposure, you're going to lose the chance to burn me at the stake. <laughs> now, that's funny. And it makes me wonder, how can somebody make a joke like that under such horrible circumstances? Would you be joking if you know they're going to burn you at the stake? How does he do that? It doesn't seem right. Unless Latimer had already been set free from the prison of life by someone who has suffered more than any of us has. When they finally burned Latimer at the stake, he turned to his friend Nicholas Ridley, who'd also been condemned for so-called heresy. He was tied to the next stake, and Latimer shouted these words. They're famous. Be of good cheer, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light up such a candle in England as I trust will never be put out. Wouldn't you know it? That's exactly what happened. Their deaths sparked a revival across the land. So try to imagine having that kind of peace of mind, that kind of presence. Imagine knowing that your life is meaningful, that you're living for something bigger than you, living for someone who will not let your lifetime, your existence just mean nothing. I don't know about you, but that thought helps me realize I'm going to make it through whatever life throws in my direction. Yeah, life is brutal, and reading the Bible will assure you that everybody suffers. But whoever loses his life for my sake, Jesus promised, will find it. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Sean Boonstra, and this has been Authentic. You want to help more people see Authentic for free? Like, comment, and subscribe, and share this episode. That tells the algorithm you really like the show, which in turn recommends Authentic to a lot more people. Thanks for your support.